Hey everyone, and welcome to today's video. Now, in this video, we've got something a bit different, and that's an interview with author, publisher, KDP, low content publisher, and a very successful one at that. And also uh, a YouTuber who's building a, a very successful channel at the moment. And this is Romney Nelson from the Life Publishing Group. That's the name of the channel. Um, hi, Romney. Hi, Paul. Thanks very much for that. That's great. And, no um, problem. Looking great forward to, to today. It's good. Yeah, great to have you here. Uh, and I think it'd be a very useful video to show people um, what it's like to be a publisher on the KDP platform, what it's like to have some success and, yeah, hopefully get a, a good insight into the business and, and, and help people along the way. So, first of all, um, I know you've been publishing books before, non-fiction books. How did you get into publishing KDP? What's your sort of backstory? Yeah, well, a number of years ago, I was um, a school teacher, and uh, that's something I did for around about 10 years. And at the end of my teaching career, I was actually a physical education teacher mm -hmm. and went into partnership with Macmillan Publishing, which is a, a, a large publishing house mm -hmm. in Australia, and um, created a physical education resource. And it was part of their... Um, I was, uh, they had a on the go for English, on the go for maths, on the go for PE. And so I worked with them to create that uh, resource. And yeah. at the time it was exciting. Um, and because I was a new author, I guess it was challenging to try and get exactly what they wanted as well. And what I probably learned through that process was that you actually lose a lot of control when you're having a publishing house that you're working with and not publishing yourself. And during that process, I had some cover design uh, aspects that I wanted to sort of implement into that design, but they were knocked on the head and they ended up having their interior designers and cover designs that came in and created the cover, but it never sat with well with me. And in fact, the book didn't end up doing particularly well. And it yeah. was because of the amount of effort I put into it, it was quite disheartening because you have a you sign contracts in regards to you know book being published and hopefully get world worldwide uh, publishing rights as well um but anyway that book went okay i guess uh but i left it go for about another oh gosh 10 years i guess it went down the path and okay. um i then had developed a fascination towards goal setting and de habit development and the very first book that i created was a journal around those elements and I actually had someone that designed it for me and put it all together and it's actually quite an expensive process because I didn't have a lot of design skills previously uh, okay. so we put that together and it actually look it went okay but it was nothing that was going to ever you know help many people and so it was a bit of a learning process and I'd only seen I'd seen a couple of videos being done about um, KDP and in fact, from that first book, I then went and joined a, a course that was about um, high content books and okay. yeah. 30,000 word books. So my, my journey on KDP actually didn't start with low or no content books. It actually started with high content books. Uh, so it was actually a good start. It got me involved. The course was expensive, I guess, um, to get going, but the people mm -hmm. that, that uh, created that, that course were very well experienced so i got a lot from it so although i probably spent a lot of money at the the front end i guess over the journey now of a couple of years of publishing it actually has helped me a lot uh and so i then went on to create another book and it's actually behind me at the top there called the habit switch and okay. uh and that actually sold a few books ebooks to start with and then it went flat and then for some reason, it sort of kicked on and yeah. became a bestseller um, in its niche, which was, or its category, which was, a, a, you know, the health and fitness niche. And you'd think that that would um, create a lot of revenue, but it didn't. I think it, as a bestseller, it probably made about $120. <laughs> so I was, uh, I okay. was expecting thousands. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's amazing how, how quickly... And I was naive to the fact that I had to keep on, uh, you know, running ads to it and things like that. And I just sort of let it go. I thought it was going to run organically and, and do really well. And yeah. very naive to the fact that I let it go and it just died off. And although I had some excellent reviews for that book, it just never recovered. And okay. so 
yeah, my first my first few months on KDP was um, yeah, it wasn't that success like it was successful in the way of getting some recognition of having a bestseller. Yeah, but it wasn't that successful in the way of getting revenue, and I was spending a lot of money in regards to advertising, and I had no idea what I was doing, and and it was probably about so if I started in. November, December, 2019, it was probably around about March or April that I then went into low content books and, and my journey from that point went forward. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a backstory about being a teacher, self-publishing and also cool. authoring a book through a major publisher and why I changed directions to actually doing it myself. So you found that doing that course, publishing your own books, did that help you in terms of then getting into the low content book sort of market? Yeah. It- it did. It, it taught me a lot about uh, niche research, although I think I got that incredibly wrong to begin with because I should never have got into creating even a high content book about habit development because it's, it's one of the most popular. competitive niches in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if there, was a, if there was a number one tip would be don't necessarily go for the, the categories or the niches that you necessarily love. Absolutely. It, you need to... You know, and I know you speak about this a lot on your channel about uh, trying to find those niches where it's uh, low competition but a high need, and that is one of the most challenging things to actually find. And I know that you and I create videos about niche research and about finding yeah. those niches. And if you can get into one of those niches, you can really expand into it, and it doesn't just become you know one or two books. You could make ten or fifteen books in the one niche and really become an expert and your brand because we can, can become recognized in that niche as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I pushed into the low content and no content, probably more so low content, more than no content. I've, I've created quite a few no content journals, but I found the most success in low content yeah. books. Yeah. Uh, Cause I can really niche down and, and find some great things in there. Yeah. Yeah. I think with the no content books, it is very competitive. They are very easy to create. So the barrier to entry is, is very low. Um, yeah. And I find a lot of people that do start in this business do go for those glamorous books, you know, the mm. coloring books, that type of thing where the competition is great, but they're also a very visually demanding book as well. You need yeah. to really get those good cover designs. Um, mm. My niche is my best-selling ones. So boring. And I really like those boring <laughs> niches. Um, yeah. And as you said, you can, you know, there is high demand in a lot of these real boring niches and they'll just provide that regular, decent income. Yeah, yeah. So you started, when did you say, was it 2019? Yeah, it about, so in, uh, yeah, in 2019, I started uh, with my initial goal-setting journal. And then I did some high-content books and it was about April of 2020. Then I then progressed onto the low content. Okay. And I was actually just watching. I hadn't even thought about low content books for some reason. Apart, I, Even when I did the journal, it, I wasn't even in the headspace of calling that a low content book. I just thought it was a book that I could yeah. create. And I thought it was amazing. I could actually self-publish a book on, on KDP on Amazon and then suddenly become an author, for example, and get it out there to the world. And so yeah. I think that's why I love the platform just because it allowed me to, yeah, to be at home pretty much and yeah. create resources for a global audience rather than just focusing on, you know, a state or, you know, or even your own country to yeah. have that capacity to even expand it to, you know, foreign countries. So I've, I've been able to change you know, quite a few of my low content books into German, Italian, into French um, oh, really? and get onto those platforms. Again, it requires, like I get um, a translator to do that for me because what you don't want to do is to create a bad experience for customers and you're, yeah. you're creating a, a low content book and then suddenly it doesn't make sense for them and then bad reviews come in. Yeah, But that's the beauty of it. Okay. Is it, it really allows you to expand into different countries. And so I, I moved into low content because of a few factors. Firstly, I felt like I could be more creative and I wasn't having to wait. Um, like a, a high con- content book takes forever to make. And so you can either, you know, you can r- go through the process and create the book yourself and write the book, or you can create 
outlines and you can get ghost writers to create those yeah. books for you. Um, or you can you know, work on low content books and really yeah, find out what's working. And I found that people spend thousands of dollars and months creating high content books, but you can have as much success, even sometimes more success by creating a, a, a letter tracing book, for example, for, yeah. you know, within four or five days that does as well, if not better. Uh, and so that's where, yeah, that's where my focus sort of went. And yeah, I've, I actually just love the creation process and, and I've, I've expanded about, you know, beyond KDP as well. So once you learn that process of publishing with KDP, you can then expand beyond KDP. And it's yeah. important to, to have diversification with, with your publishing. Yeah. That's what I've said in some of my videos, that the skills that you learn from taking part in this business you can then apply to lots of different online businesses because all the principles are, are much the same in terms yeah. of finding your niche doing the yeah. keyword research getting your content out there um, so a lot of people don't really appreciate that but probably won't appreciate it until maybe a year or two down the line yeah. when maybe they do get success with something completely different than than publishing uh, kdp yeah. books um, well, I've, um yeah Sorry, because so yeah, it's interesting that you sort of started with the high content and then used what you learnt there to then have success in a different sort of a related field, but different field in terms of its low content books. Yeah, and usually it's the flip side. Normally people learn the low content first or no content first and then go into high content. Yeah. Um, I mean, the benefits of high content books is, which I found, I, I think I've ended up doing seven high content books. Yeah. And you can have... Um, you know, obviously have the paperback, the hardback, an ebook, an audio book, uh, and yeah. and you can put those on different platforms. And so yeah. the one book becomes four or five books. So that's the power of those. But it's not to say that you can't create a really good children's book and then get that narrated into an audio book. And that's the next level that yeah. I've now sort of moved into. And it's yeah, so I think that it's a stepping stone in regards to publishing and one of the other steps i've done to diversify is i've actually helped out businesses as well to create resources for their business so what i've learned from my publishing so once you go through it you think that anyone could create it but there's actually a lot of steps involved with learning how to create a good book and i've worked with a few companies and they've said look romney we need to have a resource that covers goal setting 90 days for the business um, all the targets that we're doing yeah. and it's sort of, it's sort of a, there's a book up there that I've created um, about the 90 day goal setting for businesses. And so I worked um, with, uh, with a, 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 an owner of a business that wanted to work towards that. And now that book is used every 90 days for their team. Wow. And then it can look at expanding beyond that. And so yeah. it's what you learn during the process, you can expand beyond just creating books for KDP. You can then, expand it even further and yeah. there's so many partnerships you can form that people yeah, just need yeah. books and resources and it might be a, a local triathlete club that needs a journal yeah. for their club members and yeah. they want to track their their training and their um their weekend com competition so you can create a book for that and then suddenly you might go well we've got a whole heap of athletes that want that journal can you can you you know create it for us and so there's partnerships you can do that way that's one that's where i sort of got my initial success was because my son uh, is, is a tennis player and it suddenly occurred to me one day training journals for tennis players because i noticed all these kids you know were writing down their their, yeah. their programs what they were doing and you know keeping up to date with their stretching programs i thought hang on i could produce a book which would sort of help these guys and that's yeah. when for me it was a bit of a light bulb moment i thought hang on, there's lots of other sports as well that would benefit from similar training journals, nutrition journals, that type of thing. And that's when I started to see the, the real upside of low content books and, and creating all these different types of log books. And then it then went on to different types of log books after that. So yeah, it's interesting. A lot of people often ask about, you know, niches, where can I find, you know, good niches, but they're all around you and you just got to sort of just think laterally and, you know, and 
yeah, ideas well, it's and not, it's, around yeah. you, whether it could be work, sports, hobbies you've got. Yeah, and it's definitely not saturated. Like there's no. so many uh, niches that just have to dig a little bit deeper. And I think that's, that is, as I mentioned from the very beginning, that's one of the biggest challenges because everything flows from the book, from finding that great niche will flow through to creating a great cover design and then yeah. the, you know, the internal of your books and description yeah. and everything else flows from there. And, and if you can find a great niche, even the advertising element of it through Amazon ads, it's so much cheaper to advertise yeah. because yeah. it's less competitive. Yeah. And I found that when I was doing, you know, if it was a gratitude journal or a letter tracing journal, for example, the cost of marketing that book on Amazon was extraordinary. And yeah. it was actually very, very hard to market because some of the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, um, the bids were, you know, 70 cents a bid, yeah. for example. And if you only have to get three people to click on it, then suddenly you've lost your, any yeah. profitability out of it. That's right. Um, Cause the margins are so low on, well, not so low, but they're yeah. low on these books compared to the, yes. the bid price. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I noticed on the bookshelf behind you, you've got a, is that a letter tracing book? Is that yes, one of your books? Yeah. Ah. yeah, this was a book I created a little while ago. And I actually, I refer to it, um, I refer to it occasionally in regards to, to cover design and, and trying to get all the elements right. And, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't say it's the perfect book cover at all by any stretch, but I, I, I do... I refer to it because I, what I always try and teach to any anyone that's you know watching watching my channel or um, watching any of the content that I create is just making something pop out and yeah. and making it fun and also tailoring it to your audience. And now I see a lot like I have people that make contact with me um, occasionally in regards to their book covers and saying look why aren't I selling this book? What, what's wrong with it? And I can see immediately why it's not selling. I mean, I, I've, I'm sure I've got book cover. I know I've got book covers out there that need to be changed up and, and it definitely doesn't hit the mark. Yeah. However, I think as a customer, you can see reasons why book covers may not stand out. And I think the more road testing you do of creating book covers or even if you subcontract book cover uh, design out, yeah you know what the good elements are and it might be making sure that you're using your whole space within the yeah. book cover. Some people limit their heading or their, so their title to a small section uh, yeah. and you're only given you know, a certain size. Yeah. But when the way I look at it as well, if, if when you're looking at the thumbnail, if the thumbnail, if you can't really read the title or the subtitle on the little thumbnail on, on your smartphone, then you need to work on it even more because customers flick through so quickly and yeah. you just need to capture their attention. And yeah. this one, you need to learn from those covers that are doing well. What, what elements are they using? What, you know, what are the colors they're using? What elements are making it stand out? And a lot of people try and reinvent the wheel in regards to book cover design, but you, yeah. you just need to get, elements within successful book covers and absolutely don't copy it. That's what I'm not saying at all, but use, use features of those book covers. Yeah. Like, as I said, like the colors or like characteristics of it, because that's obviously popular. Um, and so you just need to work hard at those elements to get them right with, with any of your cover design. And so I sort of use that book because I, I do get positive feedback about it. And um, I enjoyed writing that book. Actually, that was a good one. Did you design the cover yourself? Yeah, yeah. I've um, I probably for my first four or five books, I actually outsourced it, okay. and then I attempted to do it myself. And I look back on some of those covers, and they were like horrible. Um, at the time, you you're very proud of your yeah. cover design, but I look back on them now and I think oh, I can't even believe I made a sale on one of those books. Like yeah. they were they were terrible. But uh, yeah. you you gradually just if you continue to work on it and continue to revise and get feedback, don't think that when you create a cover that it's the best ever because, and you, yeah, you also get to get used to uh, constructive feedback as I always like to sort of acknowledge. And I've, 
never been great at constructive feedback when it comes to covers because <laughs> you think your cover's great and then when someone yeah. says yeah. it's not so great then you sort of get taken back a little bit but um yeah so it's it's important just to yeah, work with people to get the right cover design and i've i've just worked hard at my cover design and i feel like i'm getting closer to where i need to be yeah and i think you've also got you've got to look at look on Amazon and study. I mean, I've spent hours and hours just going through books that are selling well. And as you say, look at the covers, other common features. And I think people try and do too much with their covers when really just some basic design principles like use of color, positioning of the title, the size of the title. And if you get that right, you're already on the you know, the mm. path to creating something that looks aesthetically pleasing. But uh, mm. yeah, it's the biggest issue I find when I look at other people's books. It's the, the cover designs that's just stopping them from getting those clicks and getting the sales. Yeah. yeah. And I think like my my start of my KT, KDP journey, and I've, I've documented this in a few of the YouTube videos on the channel, but um, yeah, the first three, three to four months was really difficult. Like I... I was spending money on advertising. I think I was behind by around about six hundred, seven hundred dollars. Like mm. I was, I was going back fast than I was going forward. <laughs> and I think the the first three months, I think I made one hundred and thirty dollars, maybe. I it might have even been after month four where I made okay. the the best seller that made one hundred and forty bucks. Right. Um, and but I had, you know, maybe around about twenty five, thirty books out by then, okay. and they just weren't. Yeah, we're in tracking. I had the high content books that, you know, I tried to implement what I was learning in the course, but again, I thought I knew better and it was, a, it was a, not the right approach. I should have been definitely listening to the people that have been there and done that before and implementing that. But again, I made the mistake of going to a niche where I had interest in it and I felt that I could bring that interest and value to people but because it was so saturated i had no chance of being able to track against the big the yeah. big people the big players in the in the um you know the uh, the day, the goal setting and the in the habit development space i just had no chance uh but it was when i'd moved to low content that i felt like i did have a chance because yeah. i could then really niche down and create the books and look, the worst thing that could happen, it was it was time that I was losing on creating a low content book that maybe didn't do particularly well. But when you create high content books, there's a fair bit of cost involved with the creation of those. Uh, in fact, yeah. you know, some books can cost you up to a thousand dollars to create Absolutely. for a high content book. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes to low content, you can afford to maybe experiment a bit more and exactly. and you know try a few different things and yeah. then after about uh april to J july income started to increase i got more knowledgeable on what i should have been doing i went into a really good niche i found a niche that was starting to get some good profitability and then in a, from october 2020 again it really scaled up and i think okay. in, in in that period of time i think i in the quarter four of 2020 um, it was around about eight and a half, nine thousand US dollars I made over that that period of time, and so over the whole quarter. Yeah, over the whole yeah. quarter, but from earning nothing for the first three months to then earning that was okay. really exciting for me because I felt that you know I could accelerate, and then this year has really really taken off, and yeah. I, you know from from around about January to. July, I'd sold 20,000 books already. Um, yeah. So that I just had learned more and more and just applied all those things that I've been learning along the way to really accelerate. Okay. So your first few months, as you said, you got to about $140 a month after three, four months. Was that right? I, yeah. Well, it was a, yeah, it was a $140 month. That's all. Like I, okay. I hadn't averaged. I think I started averaging, oh, look at this it sort of it, the scale just went up and yeah, yeah i i just kept on applying the new things so i think april was about it was march april i think it was about 140 dollars and then um in around about july a couple of months later it was about 300 or 400 dollars and then it really started to scale up um in august and september and then sort of flattened out a little bit 
middle of October, the Ben Quarter 4 came and I started to run some ads on the books that I felt really yeah. kick-started some of those books as yeah. well. And yeah, Amazon ads, as we know, it's they're, they're, they're a big challenge and I, I'm yeah. still working hard on them. Same here. I, yeah. Same here. It's, I can never predict what books are going to be successful with the, the Amazon ads. Mm. Um, some that I think, oh, this will be good. I just cannot get off the ground. Yet, whereas others yeah. seem to just, you run some ads and straight away it's ranking highly and making organic sales. Yeah. So when you got to that, the final quarter of 2020 and you made eight to $9,000 over that period, was it one particular book or was it a whole range of books that was bringing in that income? It... <sighs> There was maybe 20 books okay. that were bringing that uh, maybe it's the 80 20 rule. Um, yeah. That was sort of yeah. bringing, you know, a fair bit of the income. But yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I felt that the, the revenue I was sort of generating from a few of the books, like it wasn't as if there was one book that was bringing, you know, $3,000. It was a bit of an even spread over okay. you know, yeah, 20 or so books. Um, there's a few sort of books that were bringing maybe a couple of hundred dollars. And then the biggest surprise to me, what happened after, um, after the, about the 19th, 20th of December, there was just a cliff face where book sales just stopped and it just dropped. Yeah, I know. And I remember looking at a few Facebook groups and thinking, is it just me? Is this supposed to happen? I don't know whether this is expected. And, yeah. you know, they rightly pointed out that, um, of course, businesses shut down, KDP probably stopped printing and they have time off and there might be a bit of time there where, you know, things just stop, you know, stop. And so it took a little bit of time to build up again in, in January and yeah. get things going again. But I found there was a few, you know, niches in particular that did start to go well, like the educational resources started to get better yeah. traction again. I guess after having a break over that, Christmas period, people are resuming back to school and things like that, and therefore they require educational resources, mm. uh, and also books like you know, variations of gratitude journals and 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 sort of specific sort of diaries and things go well because people are yeah. going well. It's a new year. I'm starting fresh. I want to hit these goals, hit these targets, and then they started going well. And some countries operate on a calendar year. Other yeah. countries operate on a financial year from um you know july one and so yeah yeah i just felt that the momentum took a bit, go bit to get going but once it did get going it really took off again probably from about 20th of january yeah. and then you've got those special events um like easter that comes up and you've got mother's day and you've got father's day you, got, you know valentine's day and you know so all those sort of niches that that do pop up and i've got a list of those special occasions knowing we're not going to advertise for them as well. Yeah. 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 And when you start a lot of questions, uh, a common question I get is, you know, how quick can you start making money in this business? Do you remember when you started after you produced your first low content book, how long it took before you made your kind of first dollar, if you like? Yeah. Um, it, I know for the, for the first few months, yeah, there was, it was flatlined. I didn't make any money at all from okay. them. Um, but then when I got to know the process of, of uploading it correctly, using the right keywords, and there's always a challenge of knowing, well, when I load this book up, do I advertise on it? Uh, do I wait a certain period of time? Uh, what's the process that's sort of involved yeah. with, with launching a book? Because there's a very different process to launching high content books, low content books, no content books, yes. and getting reviews and those sorts of things. And so sort of work through that process to, to develop a bit of a game plan about what that might look like as well. And once I sort of developed that plan, when I started to launch new low content books, I had a bit more success. Yeah. And it might only take a few days before I got, re, um, got sales, but the biggest thing, the biggest challenge that we have for low and no content uh, publishers is, well, uh, you sort of need, you need reviews to get the social proof to then sell your books. Mm. But you, you know, without the reviews, people don't buy your books, but you need people to buy your books to get the reviews. And so it's a, yeah. it's a catch 22. And so that's, yeah. that's the hardest thing. So I've, you know, my launch plan um, uh, is something that I, 
you know, I'm, I'm developing and I'm, I'm, I'm going to develop and put into a course so that people sort of can see what my plan is moving forward from when I develop the book to the process of day one and when it goes live and what I do. Yeah. Um, and it's taken a fair bit of time and it's, it's something that I hadn't really ever shared because it, it does take so much time to sort of work that out. Yeah. And at some point in time, I you know, absolutely want to want to share that plan so that people have more success when they're launching their books. Sure. Um, yeah. But from day one, sometimes you expect that you'll get a few sales off the bat, but other times it might take, you know, a, a couple of months. And yeah. I know that you can get impatient when you've created the book and you're not getting any sales. And yeah. some of my bestsellers, was very flat for the first three months and then they started to pick up and by about the six month mark uh they might have been selling you know two or three per day uh yeah. and then that adds up it doesn't sound like much per day but you know over the course of the week that adds up and then over the course of the month it's even more yeah uh, and that's one book if you've got 100 books it definitely adds up yeah i remember with my my bestseller i mean i remember i published it and got a sale within it was like two or three days but then over the next six to 12 months, it was up and down in the rankings, really just all over the place. Yeah. And then it took, I think it's about eight months before it then started to settle down and gradually rise. And then sales just became sort of consistent and it, you know, it ranked um, highly, uh, well, it has done ever since. And that's without running ads. But it's interesting what you say about the ads and reviews. I tend to, my, the strategy I use is not to make some, to make money from my books with ads, but just to get those sales. And I'm probably on a lot of my books actually make a loss, but it's to get those reviews to get the social proof, but also it helps with the, the algorithm and the, the ranking as well, which is ultimately, you know, my aim for my books to get them ranked organically. Yeah. And I think that's, it is one of the hardest things regarding your books that to make an investment at the front end, for example, um, you know, running Amazon ads, yeah. yes, you do need to spend some money at the front end to then allow it to sort of get ranked better over the first 30 days in particular when you launch your book. There's a bit of a boost period there where, yeah. you, you know, that Amazon sort of boosts your book to see whether it's, you know, something yeah. that customers want. Yeah. And I've found that if I invest just a little bit of money at the front end, then it pays off at the back end. And okay. I think um, it's... Yeah, it's getting, it is becoming more competitive, particularly in certain kinds of niches, but you can still absolutely find niches that don't have the competition that you can rank well. You can run Amazon ads without them becoming too expensive as well. Yeah, um, yeah. But the biggest hurdle, like even when you're starting a business is investing money at the front end and yeah. you're not seeing any return, mm. but to then have confidence in what you're doing to, you know, to generate that later on. And, uh yeah amazon kdp for some for some people they expect the results immediately yeah um but trust me if you stick with it and keep with it and be consistent about it like many things in life you'll end up getting the results but you've just got to um you know roll with the punches in a way because you will get setbacks and i remember in about august of 2020 I'd started to go well, then there was a bit of a drop off and I was spending so much on ads as, as well, trying to get my books to rank that I hit a bit of a flat spot as well. And yeah. I was starting to question, well, you know, is this something I can sort of do long-term? But if I hadn't persisted, if I hadn't you yeah, know, yeah. worked on the things that were going wrong and learned from them, then I wouldn't be where I am now. And yeah, you, you, you just got to keep with it. it it's yeah. really, really hard, but you've just got to keep with it. Yeah, I've noticed it goes through cycles as well. And I have those episodes where I think all my sales are going down the pan. Things are not selling as well as they used to. Is this the end of my business? And it also happens with YouTube as well. You think, oh, no, things are not working. But all of a sudden, for whatever reason, it then starts to pick up again. Um, so you just got to, as you say, you've got to stick with it. And especially at the beginning, it can get very frustrating for a lot of people i know because they yeah you know, i think i think yeah. i remember you saying paul that you said like a youtube channel as well with your kdp publishing i'm gonna give it 12 months yeah no matter yeah. no matter the setbacks no matter what happens i'm just gonna give it 12 months yeah and it almost has to be that mindset where you think look yeah. i just need to take action 
And I, I can't just keep putting it off. If I want to give it a go, then, mm. you know, learn, learn as much as you can, but remember don't have content overload where you're listening to so much information that you do get overload and you don't know where to start. Yeah. Um, just create a little bit of a game plan and have, have some small goals that you set for yourself. And then, you know, each day, just, just peek away at that, that, at what the little goal that you've got have like, for, for example, I have five goals that I want to achieve every month um, for publishing. And, you know, the other day, or yesterday, I think it was, I actually set my December goals and I've just got five oh, really? key goals. And so therefore, if I'm getting off track and, I lose focus. I can just look up at that board and go, do you know what? That's nice. what I need to focus on. Nice. And um, yeah, it's really, it's really helped because I think when you get clarity on what you want to achieve and you have a goal in place, then suddenly everything becomes a lot clearer for you and you start focusing on the right things. You start looking for the right opportunities You start listening to the right content yeah. and you can move forward. So that's something else I think that people need to do just just write some simple goals down and 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 you just get some direction about where you're going with your publishing rather than just sporadically creating books just go yeah. do you know what this month i'm just going to focus on one niche i'm going to create three three books um they're low no content books or even low content books and i'm just going to work on the quality of those books i'm not going to yeah pump out 50 books yeah. because you you lose lose track of where those books are going and you can't yeah. market them so yeah. Definitely quality over quantity. That's what I learned in this business. I started with quantity um, yeah. and it probably took about a year before I realized that quantity was the uh, <laughs> quantity, <that> quality, <laughs> quality was the, the key and not, not quantity. Um, yeah. Again, people ask me, you know, what's the maximum number of books I can publish a day? And it's like, oh, it's not what you yeah. should be asking really, because no. you know, your, your, your mindset's not in the right place. It's got to be, it's got to be, you know, don't produce as many, but produce high quality, the best quality books you can. Um, yeah, that's right. And so maybe, what's your plan? Maybe go, 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 go. Sorry, go I was on. just going to say for the first, for the first maybe couple of months in KDP, um, and we've discussed this privately before about the importance of um, maybe creating seven or 10 books, even if they're no content books, just to get used to yeah, the yeah. process of uploading, niche research, um, the keywords, those sorts of things, just to get used to that. And, yeah. and also I remember when I first started, I was getting knockbacks from KDP because my covers weren't formatted correctly and I, I needed to add 0.125 inches or, you know, to the, <laughs> oh, to the boundaries of it. Yeah. I didn't know what was going on. Um, no. And so maybe do those first seven or 10 to get used to it and then really try and get that quality happening yeah, uh, and, and focus on that. Yeah. yeah, you've got to get used to the process first of all, as you say. And then start to look at various niches and producing just one or two books, good quality books and concentrating on those. And again, yeah. it's all about experimenting. That's how you learn. Mm. That's how you remember. And you pick up new things as you go along. And all of a sudden, you've amassed all this knowledge. Yeah. So what's your plans sort of from now going forward? What do you, what are you sort of, where are you heading? What is it you're trying to concentrate on? Yeah. Is it KDP? Well, is it other business areas? Yeah, I, I do enjoy, I thoroughly enjoy the publishing side of things. And I've actually enjoyed the new challenge of creating a, a channel. And, and in some respects, it actually reminds me of publishing because you've got to create good content that yeah. your customers or your, your viewers are going to want to watch. Um, they can almost do a bit of a look inside feature and, and see what you, you know, what your video is about. They can see the first 30 seconds, for example, your thumbnails like a book cover. So if your mm -hmm. thumbnail is not, yeah, you know, so I do, I do feel like the YouTube channel is very similar to my publishing and, and I look back on my first thumbnails, for example, the YouTube channel, and they're not great. And it was yeah. like my journey with publishing as well. And so I, I, I do want to continue to expand on my, you know, what, what I've learned from the last couple of years of publishing and really provide that back to um, people that, are, you know, on the journey that I'm on, they might yeah. be, you know, they might've been publishing for a couple of years, like, like myself, or they might be new to KDP. Yeah. Uh, so I've been um, working on a, on a, on a course that I'd love to develop and, and, and provide, Excellent. you know, some deep information that I, I share, I share a lot of information on YouTube and there's, yeah. 
there's plenty of information on there that I share. But I think the course, I want to just go even further because I can actually, with a course, I can um, just really focus on exactly what I think my journey was like when I first started and what I needed mm. to know. And if I can create the course, people have all the content in the one place rather than trying to go back through my playlists and things like that. Yeah. So that's sort of one main focus area for me is to create something, um, a course that people can can help with their journey as well. Yeah. And I think with my publishing as well, I have expanded those income streams to different different pathways, for example, working with businesses to help create resources. Um, there's some public speaking engagements that I've sort of been asked to attend okay. now because of those books. And so My that's idea another of a thing. nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, it's sort of funny, like I, I, I completed a lot, of, a lot of public speaking, I guess because I was a teacher and yeah, I've always felt yeah. comfortable with it. But since we've been going through periods of different lockdowns and things like that, you do become quite insular and you get, get used to working in your own office and space at home, for example. Mm. And it's like learning to write again. You sort of got to feel confident with, uh, with engaging. And the other day I had um, a, a, it was a, a presentation I did for around about 50 people that were at a, at a, at a uh, seminar. And so I was talking about a few different elements of, of the book and everything like that. And, to start with, I was quite nervous getting going, but you know, soon felt comfortable as as it went on. But mm. they're the opportunities that you do get, and it's building that brand awareness, yeah. and that's probably one of the other challenges you initially have when you first start publishing is to create your brand because you don't mm. know whether to create your brand under a business name. Do you create it under your own name? Do you create it under an alias? Oh, no. uh, and, and before you know it, you're sort of up and going and you think, well, maybe I should have changed that. And it's actually yeah. hard to turn around to, to come back because um, I've got a few different pen names that I operate under, not all under the, under the one platform. And so I think it just gives you a bit of diversification as well yeah. um, with, with the books you're creating. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also some amazing opportunities and and I find it exhilarating when you create a great book and you see it, you know, tracking really well. And yeah. I find the same with any content I create for YouTube. I get yeah, yeah, absolutely. the same feeling. It's, it's, yeah. it's really, it's really nice to know you're helping people. Yeah. So where, pe where can people find your content? Yeah. Thanks, Paul. It's um, so my channel is the life graduate publishing group and okay. that's the YouTube channel. Uh, and it's pretty much if you jump on there, I've got you know the links in the description to to what I'm doing, and um, that's sort of the main the main spot. My okay. website's thelifegraduate.com, and yeah, it's sort of a it's a growing growing platform, I guess, because you've you've got the opportunity for publishing books, for the social media element of things, yeah, um, and it's something I'm passionate about and I love doing, and you know it's it's nice to be able to chat with someone like yourself that's been involved in the same industry and yeah, yeah. we surprising enough we actually don't get the opportunity of speaking like this very often so it's actually nice to do this yeah well that's fantastic so you've got your youtube channel and you've got your your website as well so everyone get along there watch the videos on this channel very educational very useful and, and obviously don't forget to subscribe well, Romney, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much for, for coming on to, to my channel and, and, and answering the questions. I hope all of you out there have, have found this content useful and, and hopefully have, have learned something. So, Romney, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. Really appreciate it and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye.